Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. I'm Ken Duke, my co-host, Terry Battisti is out sick. He sprained his beard, but he's on the mend and he'll be back for our next episode. Our producer and engineer is the glorious Nathan Benson. My personal title for this episode of the Big Bass Podcast is Fox in the Hen House. It's one of my very favorite Big Bass stories, probably because it's incredibly obscure. It's a very little known tale about one of the strange ways that Big Bass have impacted the world and other species in the animal kingdom. It happened very far from where I'm recording and, and likely very far from where you're listening. It's a cautionary tale of the consequences that can occur when we play checkers on nature's chessboard. Spoiler alert, this story does not have a happy ending. Nevertheless, here we go. I first heard about this story in 2009. Back then, Nathan and I were working for BASS, and I was writing a book with Glenn Lau. If you're not familiar with the name Glenn Lau, you should be. He was the greatest underwater cinematographer that freshwater fishing has ever known. And his film, Big Mouth, was the first and still the very best look at the underwater world of bass. That film was released in 1973. And if you've never seen it, you're in for a treat. It's nothing short of epic. Glenn did a lot of television and commercial work through the years. He even did a sequel to Big Mouth in 1996 that's titled Big Mouth Forever. It's also a must watch. You can find that one on YouTube. It's my opinion that Glenn Lau's contribution to the sport of bass fishing is so great that if we had a Mount Rushmore, he should be on it, along with James Henshaw, Jason Lucas, and Ray Scott. But I digress. Back in 2009, I was working on a book with Glenn titled Bass Forever. It's basically a memoir of his life in bass fishing and filmmaking. And although I technically wrote it, it's really Glenn's book, told from Glenn's point of view and telling Glenn's stories. Chapter 7 of Bass Forever is all about big bass. Just like you and me, Glenn was fascinated by big bass. He loved to catch them, he loved to film them, and he even spent a couple of years trying to grow a world record in the 1980s. But that's another story that I'll save for another episode. For now, I need you to know that Glenn was born and raised in Ohio, and he fished and guided on Lake Erie. He didn't have a lot of experience with big largemouth bass until he was in his 30s when he began fishing and exploring outside the state of Ohio. Here's part of the story Glenn told in Bass Forever. I'm quoting here. My search for record class bass began in 1965. I heard rumors about amazing growth rates in bass imported from the United States and transplanted in Lake Antietam in Guatemala. A biologist there, Dr. Anne Labastille from Cornell University, was studying the giant pied billed grebe a large bird that lives on water. According to her research, the bird's numbers were declining sharply and it was near extinction." End quote. I'll stop right there to tell you that Glenn was a lot less interested in the bass in Lake Atitlan than he was the biologist, Anne Labastille. In 1965, she and Glenn were both in their 30s. Labastille, an attractive blonde who loved nature and fishing, was coming out of divorce. Glenn, who loved nature and fishing, was in an unhappy marriage. Since we've set the scene with Glenn and Anne, now it's time to dig a little deeper on the lake and the bird. Lago de Atitlan is in the Guatemalan highlands of the Sierra Madre Mountains. It's the deepest lake in Central America at more than 1,100 feet, and it covers about 30,000 surface acres. The lake basin is the remnant of a volcano that last erupted about 84,000 years ago. And Atitlan is widely regarded as one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. It's a major tourist attraction in Guatemala. It's also the only place in the world where the giant pied-billed grebe existed. And in 1965, when Glenn Lau went there to see Anne Labastille, 
there were fewer than 200 of the birds anywhere on the planet. A little about the giant pied-billed grebe, or Podilimbus gigas, to all you Latin speakers out there. A pied-billed simply means that the bird's bill is two different colors. In the case of this grebe, the bill resembles that of a chicken, and there's a dark stripe that runs vertically across the otherwise gray bill. It, it sort of looks like someone has clamped the bill shut with dark tape. Uh, an ordinary grebe, and, and a grebe looks to me a little bit like a, like a, what we would call a coot in the south, uh, maybe a little larger, and certainly larger in the case of a giant. Uh, an ordinary grebe measures about 12 to 15 inches long, but the giant grebe measures about 20 inches. They don't fly. And because the positioning of the legs on the body, they really can't walk on land. They live on the water. They nest in shoreline vegetation, especially tall reeds, and they dive for their food. There are pied-billed grebes in North America today, but the species is endangered. And, as I mentioned, the only giant pied-billed grebes, grebes ever identified were on Lake Atitlan. They were first discovered by a naturalist in the 1920s. So how did bass get into this mix of volcanic lake basins and rare birds? Well, of course, people did that. There's no other way for a fish to get from the bass's home or transplanted range into such a remote body of water so high in the Sierra Madres. Because Atitlan was such a draw for tourists, there were regular flights coming there from the United States. In 1958 and again in 1960, that's about the same time that Orville Ball was importing Florida bass into Southern California, Pan American Airwaves and a Teetlin Hotel were flying largemouth bass to the lake. In 1958, they released a few dozen fingerlings. In 1960, it was 2,000. They hoped it would attract more tourists if they could establish a bass fishery there. Not surprisingly, though, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service technician who actually helped to facilitate the stocking tried to discourage it. Of course, nobody listened. They had big bucks in their head. Anne LaBastille came to Lake Atitlan in the mid-1960s after hearing the grebe population was in severe decline. It was an opportunity for her to put herself on the map as a naturalist and to publish something very meaningful in her career. Shortly after she arrived, she was scanning the lake, looking for the birds, when two scuba diving snorkelers came out of the water. Each one of them had a big largemouth bass tied to his belt. She estimated the weights of those bass at about 15 pounds each. Now, keep in mind, these fish could not have been more than six years old. They had grown at a rate of at least two and a half pounds per year. Local crabbers and commercial anglers that were targeting other species reported a tremendous decline in their harvest that began about the time bass were introduced. Most of them blamed the bass for devastating the population of baby grebes, gobbling them up faster than they could hatch. When La, when La Bastille asked about the largest Lobina Negra, or black bass, that any of the locals had seen, she was told 25 pounds. It means that the fish had grown from fingerlings to world record size in seven years, maybe less. Here's what Glenn Lau said about the lake in Bass Forever. The bass in the Teetland were thriving, perhaps doing better there than anywhere else they have lived and grown before or since. The problem was that they were succeeding at the expense of crabs, frogs, snails, native fish, and of course, the grebes. The numbers of these other species were decreasing rapidly while the bass grew to giant sizes and at incredible rates. I began diving in a teatlan and studying its habitat. It had a tremendous number of reeds and lush aquatic growth along its shoreline. A teetlin is as much as 1,200 feet deep in places and had a wide variety of ideal food species. It was the perfect combination 
for growing monster-sized largemouths. That's what Glenn Lau had to say in his, his memoir, Bass Forever. Now, Anne LaBastille herself wrote two books that tell the story of Lake Atitlan and the giant pied-billed grebe. Uh, the first, Assignment Wildlife, was published in 1980. It tells only a, a part of the story, a very abbreviated version. Uh, in her book, Mama Pac, and Pac is, a, is, is the, the name the locals in Guatemala there have for the grebe, uh, Mama Pac came out in 1990, and it's all about her adventures in Guatemala trying to save the grebe. Uh, in these books, she tells a story of all her research, and, and her conclusion is that, that bass were a, a major factor in uh, the decline of the grebes. One of her most amusing stories in uh, Mama Pac tells about a confrontation she had with a local minister of agriculture. He was absolutely indifferent to her pleas on behalf of the giant pied-billed grebe until, in, in broken Spanish, La Bastille screamed at him and said, the black bass has f***ed up the lake. That apparently got his attention. Eventually, La Bastille convinced local authorities to amend some of the fishing regulations and even to change some of the agricultural practices in an effort to save the grebe's forage base and habitat. They even screened off a sanctuary for the birds and poisoned the bass that were inside that part of the lake. Guatemalan postage stamps were dedicated to creating awareness and support for the giant pied-billed grebe. And at least for a while, it seemed like they were making some real progress towards saving the bird. In 1965, they did a population count uh, that reported just 80 grebes. That's about the time Glenn Lau got there. Uh, three years later, 1968, they counted 125, so they'd increased the population by about 50%. By 1973, there were 210. Things were going in the right direction. The grebe population was increasing, and, and a naturalist like Anne Labastille was thinking, hey, maybe these, maybe these birds can be saved. Uh, but then, in 1976, disaster struck Guatemala in the form of a major earthquake. It was a 7.5 on the Richter scale, and I don't know anything about the Richter scale, but I know a, a big number like 7 plus, 8 plus. That's devastation. And this particular earthquake killed more than 10,000 people. Uh, at Lake Atitlan, it caused the lake bed to fracture, and much of the water drained out, uh, destroying a lot of the grebe's habitat, and it also destroyed the sanctuary that local authorities and Anne Labastille had built. Four years later, 1980, only 32 of the birds were left. 32. Remarkably small population. They were beyond endangered. They were, they were almost extinct. Uh, and in a last-ditch effort to save them, authorities tried relocating some of these grebes to another lake. Uh, the relocation effort included a pair of mating adults. These mating adults had two eggs. One of the eggs hatched, and for a few days, the parent birds were seen leading the little chick out into the lake. But then the chick disappeared. A big largemouth bass ate it. So you, you see where this is going. Uh, by 1985, only 56 adult grebes were counted. Four years later, there were two. Endlings uh, is a term that biologists use when they're referring to the very last of a species. When you get down to two, you're talking about endlings. And to see endlings must be a, a very profound event. Ultimately, the giant pied bill grebe could not withstand the loss of habitat uh, caused by agricultural practices, caused by an earthquake. Uh, and they couldn't withstand the predation from an invasive species, in this case, our beloved largemouth bass. And the giant pied bill grebe became extinct in 1989. Um, Anne Labastille, 
died of Alzheimer's disease in a New York nursing home in 2011. She was 77 years old. My friend Glenn Lau passed away in 2021 in Florida. He was 85. Their romance never really blossomed before it also went the way of the Grebe. Um, and the Bass of Lago de Atitlan? What happened to them? Well, they suffered a loss of habitat too. Uh, commercial fishing took a very serious toll on the lake. And then, of course, there were the, the poisoning efforts when uh, the locals discovered what the bass was doing, not just to the grebe, but to the local species that they commercially fished. They tried poisoning them. And, uh, and their efforts were apparently fairly effective. Today, the lake has sewage issues. There are a lot of villages on the banks of the lake and, uh, and they're dumping apparently considerable amounts of raw sewage into the water there. Nevertheless, uh, I've read some reports as, as recently as the last 10 years saying that there are still largemouth bass in Lake Atitlan, including some big ones. Maybe there always will be. We know how hard it is to get rid of bass. We know what a hardy species they are. It's one of the things that makes them so appealing. It's one of the things that's led to them being the, the most widespread freshwater sport fish in the world. Uh, and with that, I'm going to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. Uh, I want to thank you for joining me. I know your time is valuable and I appreciate your spending some of it with me. If you enjoy the show, I hope you'll hit the like and the subscribe buttons. If you really liked it, please tell your friends about it. It would help us a lot. You know, Terry Nathan and I started the Big Bass Podcast uh, nine months ago now in January of 2023. And as of this recording, we have 1,443 subscribers on YouTube. Quite a few more on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. But our growth has been pretty slow especially in the last few months. We enjoy putting each show together, but it's also a lot of work and the research is extremely time consuming. Uh, anything you might be able to do to increase awareness of our program, any ideas you might have about making the show better, stronger, growing our reach would be deeply appreciated. If you want to contact us, maybe you want to sponsor the show and make us rich beyond our wildest dreams. You can reach us by, via email. Uh, my email address is ken at thebigbasspodcast.com. You can reach Terry Battisti at terry at thebigbasspodcast.com or Nathan Benson at nathan at thebigbasspodcast.com. Next week's show is going to be a live episode. Terry will be back and he'll join me and Nathan to take your questions and comments. We'll talk about Big Bass and we'll also have a major announcement about the future of the Big Bass Podcast. Until then, remember size matters. <laughs>